<laughs> I guess we have to be authorly now. Oh, yes. Yes, let's be very serious about oh, this. Oh, get my tweed jacket out. <laughs> I did bring, I got my uh, Plutonian queen outfit over there in the wagon. I thought, just in case I need it. Oh, nice. With the ball thing. <laughs> um, are you, so we're rolling? Awesome. Okay. Um, thank you so much for having us here. Where apparently. is it we look? Where I think we can just look at each other. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so I wanted to say at the outset something that may embarrass you, and I hope that it won't, but um, but I want to say it anyway. I was 13 when uh, Letourneau's used auto parts came out. And, and you lived in Waterville. And I lived in Waterville. Yes. I oh, you, you go to the Railroad Square Cinema? Of somewhere? course. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that book was important to me for a bunch of different reasons, but principally because I was at that age, it was around the time when I first asked my parents for a typewriter. Oh. <laughs> and it was such an audacious, looking back, it was such an audacious thing to imagine that, you know, a redneck kid from Waterville could be an author, you know? Oh, yeah. It was weird to think we could be because all the others had their tweed jackets and the, and Correct, the whole thing. Right. And so, but to see that book come out to know who you were and where you were from and how you lived um, and the life that you had. And to even honestly, to see the name Letourneau on the cover of a book, uh -huh. it meant a tremendous amount to me. Um, it made this little inkling of an idea that I had of being an author. It made it wow. actual in a way that it wouldn't have otherwise. Well, that's and so, neat. That's neat. And I know you didn't do it for that reason, right? You wrote the book because you wrote the book. But but I think it's important for us as authors to understand the ways in which, especially since so much of our work is done in a solitary way, mm -hmm. and, and then we send it out into the world and we have no idea whether or not it actually lands anywhere, you know, right, what right. it's doing in, in the world. Do it for yourself. But mm -hmm. I think it's, I just wanted to say that that was really important to me when I was, and I got oh. that typewriter. Oh, you did, right? Yeah, <laughs> even though I don't think my parents could afford it, but I think they knew mm -hmm. how important it was to me. So, but that was a big deal but to me. But also, if you actually wound up using it, they would be happy. It's when you get the kids something and then Oh, they, I used it. <laughs> I used it for sure. You um, know, I have to say the, it, I could have written that and then it would have just stayed in the drawer. Yeah. Because I'm very shy and I don't push things. I even didn't. after beans? Yeah. And what happened was I was at the Stone Coast Conference and a guy who was there and a woman who were there really pushed to get this stuff pub my stuff published. It wasn't, I could never have done it by myself. And once it was there, this guy sent it to his, edit, his editor. Well, I, there were some short stories that got published first, sorry. And then this guy sent my first book to his editor. Uh -huh. Because that editor and the print, the president of the company at that t at that particular company, Houghton Mifflin, Tickner Fields, Houghton Mifflin, yep. he he came here and came to McDowell when I was there. He used to tell me all this stuff, right? And you probably remember Michael. Whoops, sorry, I'm there. he's off off <laughs> off camera. Right? Um, he said that. Um, he always remembers being in this in the room where they had the board and the editor coming in with that first book and he said I, I want I wanted that book real bad and I real and I got it so later I got to know him he was working class guy yeah who went in the war World War II when he got out with the GI Bill he went and got his degree in history and then he wound up being a book salesman and then he wound up being the president of Houghton Mifflin because he just loved books yeah. he says that's not why they become presidents now right but he said then that was what it was so I got thinking about it. and he and he loves snowman which so many people hated and he goes <laughs> you know <laughs> it was it was kind of funny I mean like he always goes wow we got to get more reviewers that are working class they these you know, middle class professionals don't understand you and and you really need more of that. He used to say all kinds of wicked neat encouraging things to me about So did that he convince idea. was it him that convinced you then that it was okay to sort of let it go and let it go? Well out by of the publishing world? it. By you know, he accepted that book. Yeah. 
And when time he got here, probably there'd been a couple more published. In fact, the time he got here, I might have actually been with another company because he had retired. And when that's he, interesting to me, and it sort of it sort of leads into the first question I wanted to ask you, which <clears throat> will seem simple on its surface, I think, but for those of us who do it, we realize it's not simple. And the question is, why do you write? And and more so, it's sort of a multi-part. Mm-hmm. If you'll allow me. Yeah, one at a time, because I got ADHD. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'll never remember them all. <laughs> well, they're all sort of the same question. And oh. me, uh, why did why do you write? Why did you start? And why do you continue? Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um. I I probably my childhood was so boring and safe and perfect. <laughs> you know, it was. In Cape Elizabeth. Yeah, and quite. We weren't Cape... Cape Elizabeth was different back in those days. I, be, I would imagine. Yeah, you had the movie stars of rich people right on the water, and then you have farms and working class people. You didn't have too many middle class professionals until around the time I was in high school. They started to tear up the carrot fields and tear, cut the woods and build all these split-level houses, and then they moved in. Yeah. But... Um, but it was like my folks were and my grand folks were there every day. They came in from Paul, you know, over the bridge and came to visit. It was a very family, quiet life. Yeah. Um, the only horrible thing was school because it was mm-hmm. so creepy. Yeah. <laughs> very creepy. Um, um, the, it, it was, I mean, like, I, I was. Excuse me a minute. No, no. <laughs> it's not COVID. It's my applesauce in my brain. Um, um, I um, wanted more. Uh, you know, I'm easily bored. So <laughs> it was, uh, I'd go down to the pond. I'd go outside. I'd walk in the woods. and do different things. And then go in my room. And I had all these projects all the time. Yeah. So when I was a kid, I started to do a lot of pretending. Like I had, um, you know... Barbie dolls they gave me, you know, for Christmas. And I said, well, I really would... They go, you want Ken to... Or no, I don't like Ken. He's too dippy or something. No, I want G.I. Joe. He looks like Castro. <laughs> he looks like <laughs> Castro. Actually, yeah. I don't know if I knew he was Castro at that time because I think he was a little before. Because wasn't... Ca- what, what, when was Castro taking over... <laughs> Take well, over Cuba, what he is. It was late 50s, right? Is yeah. He right? says, so I was young. Yeah, okay, I wasn't married yet. <laughs> I was married shortly after that. But, um, yeah, and I thought that he was wicked cool when he was on the news. He'd stand there with all his guys, you know, and he wasn't like, I love the Russians, too. Banging their shoe, you know, Khrushchev. They were so much more interesting than the, <laughs> than the American guys who, <laughs> right. you know, they don't, you know, they're dull. Anyway. So I, um, then I had horses for them, and I did this, like, made-up whole little world. And then I started writing instead. I wrote up, um, oh, by, by the time I was, like, 12, it turned into kind of like porn. I was really, I'm really into the porn thing, but I didn't want anybody to see it. But I, I uh. really was into writing <laughs> porn. And um, so I, excuse me, <laughs> and so I did a lot of that, and then... From there, I mean, novels and different things. But so, the Beans came out when you were, how old were you? Mid-30s? Oh, were you in your mid-30s? 37, maybe. My grandson was born. So, you had been, had you been writing that whole time? Yeah, in and out of it. I, um, see, what happened was I, I was married for a while to my, my first husband. We went to night school in Portland. Yeah. To get our, um degree the GRE. You know, whatever that is oh not the gre uh, graduate you know it was the actual thing GED, yeah no it was a, a diploma oh you got a high school diploma yeah it wasn't like studying for a test you you just went and had classes got it. okay it was sort of like night school in college yeah i loved it it was so different than day school where you have the prussian industrial military model for regular public school is the prussian there's no secret about it either it's a it's made to create a military and an industrial bunch of people all the same with honors and losers and all that stuff. Right. This uh, this engine of class division. And you certainly touch on that in the book. Yeah, I, I, I hate that stuff. But, but I know it's natural. The humans do it. 
but I don't have to like it. But anyway, so <laughs> we we went to night school. It was different. I remember this man, Mr. Body. He was the, um, we just, you know, we still called them Mr. and Mrs. Um, he was an uh, English teacher at the Portland High School. Yeah. I loved him. He would carry on and do all this, like, um, um, entertaining stuff and read poetry with all this flair and all that. It was really interesting, and I started to like it so much better than when they hold you captive sure. and don't have to really try, you know, to hold your attention. Right. And was that... So I think about that in my own experience with teachers who maybe color outside the lines a little bit in the school where I was and, and gave me an indication that the interest that I had in reading and writing was maybe... You know, it made sense. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you feel as though that was the case with this teacher? Was it something that you... If oh. he was reading poetry in class and you're thinking, okay... He didn't talk about my writing. He was reading... He was sure. talking about the... Um, he was a liter literary... Uh, he was teaching us literature. Yeah. But it was just made it more interesting, whereas before I was bored... Right. By it that. wasn't so staid and sort of stuffy. and. Yeah, when it wasn't scary. Like, teachers did awful things to kids when I was sure. out there in the 50s. But but then, I, after I moved to Gorham, my neighbor taught me in, um, into taking some night courses at U, uh, Pogo U. Right. And so I did, and I love that, boy. And I, I don't understand all this stuff about taking standardized test and then they got to take a entrance test to college i just started taking the courses and then i go i would like to go in the daytime now and they go okay and i pay my money and i got um work study grants and loans and the loans were teeny yeah i mean because the cost was teeny it was so tiny then and um i i thought i might major in one of the social sciences but I just loved all the social sciences. I took them all. Right. A little of everything. And some uh, the English stuff and some writing. Well, that makes sense to me, too, because it's, you strike me as, I think all novelists need to be interested in people, mm. you know? Mm. But you strike me as particularly interested in the, in the entirety of people, which is, which is part of the reason why I think that this project, it's a, it is four volumes, correct? If I can get that last one, yeah, it's going to be four. Yeah, okay. not five. But, but it's massive. I yeah. mean, 3,000 pages, it's a scope that I can't even conceive of. As I'm one of those novelists who, no matter what I'm writing about, no matter how big I think it's going to be, it always lands around 300 pages, no oh, matter what. so lucky. But, <laughs> but, so but, but you, you work in both, right? Because Letourneau's was, what, 250 pages? That's a slender book. Yeah, that was in the beginning more of it. Then as, as I got older, life took on <laughs> more. Uh, also, I, I got that first draft of that whole thing. Yeah. All those books were one big draft. Right. And it, it was big, but it wasn't ready. It was very sketch. It was thin. It wasn't... It just as I read it, I go, oh, no well, one. sure. And, um, <laughs> but I turned it in, and my editor's like, oh, well, um, it's big, but we don't. Oh, uh, and he, his, the big editor of the whole company at that time, I think we had moved on to, um, yeah, we had moved on to Harcourt by then. And he, he um, they, they, he sent me a letter through the mail, the big guy, mm -hmm. with suggestions of what to do. Oh, fun. And I took the envelope and I, I didn't throw it away, but I stuffed it somewhere. <laughs> I don't even know where it is now. Nobody tells me what to do. Sure. Because now you've got this screaming voice on one ear. I, you know, I have to, I have to watch it develop and the people have to decide what, sure. the, the characters have to decide what they're going to do. Absolutely. So I go, no, but somebody, by the time I, um, it got, I'm trying to think, he, my editor died in 204, right? I hadn't, it hadn't moved. It was just in my drawer. My Still one manuscript. Yeah. My agent, my wonderful agent, Jane, secret agent Jane, she, she, um, 
she left me a message. I call her. She goes, Carolyn, you know, people are going to forget who you are. They're going to forget your work. You've got, you've got to do something with that book. She goes, have you ever thought of doing a book with just Jane and Mickey? Mm-hmm. I, oh, I hadn't even hung the phone up yet when I, I could see the whole book going that way. Like you take and you take focus on certain characters. And then you focus, and they can all be in the thing. In other words, Jane and Mickey could still be in the other ones too, sure. but their big focus would be that first one. Yeah. And so I was so excited. I went and um, threw some plant out, <laughs> these plants that were there, and I set up my manuscripts. I started breaking them up. I like, oh, here. So that's how it started. Yeah. That phone call. Yeah. She said, you know, why don't you ever thought of doing those two? And so. Um, and so what has that process been like since then? The process of easy. breaking the main... Really? So easy. Really? Because it's already... The characters are already visual. I can see them. They're already stuff. It's easy. I just have trouble getting away from my life here. I See, we don't have conveniences. Mm-hmm. We don't have plumbing. We don't... When, to fill a kettle of water to heat it, I have to put the faucet on and it dribbles out like tears out of a hose that goes out and so all day I'm doing all this stuff and I can't not do it and I want the house you know I'm not oh there's dust there's mouse poops spiders in that <laughs> house so bad and now uh, my old dog it's like the tree house the spiders oh yeah <laughs> my my old dog Brewster he's got this idea now that he's going to pee all over the house mm. and he won't stop and I and I know that he's only got a little time left and I don't want to scold him sure so um and he's having trouble getting out the dog door they have a dog door um because Jake our problem child the minute he showed up he would smash his way through the dog door and knock everybody over so now these guys are a little bit blind and deaf not real blind but you know funny they really don't want to get in that box with him charging throw sure. you know so now they just wait, and then he can't hold it. And so the house is horrible. I mean, this is horrible. But I, the stuff I have to do, I have to cook. And I have to cook with food pantry stuff, which is intended to kill you. High calorie. You know, the, when the selectman, he goes, whoa, he goes, it's better than starving. I go, oh, diabetes, stroke, yeah. it's better than starving. Yeah. That stuff is horrible. And the good stuff is rotten. Michael got food, he got food poisoning from some the meat, pork. the meat and the veggies, right? Like it's, yeah. Um, yeah. so basically what it amounts to is that, I mean, it's an interesting thing because it's something that I wanted to talk about. I had a question about, which is basically that in order to do something like, right, you need time, you need space. And if you, and, and exactly. the thing that principally affords us time and space in this culture is money. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so, like so Tolstoy. How so? It was cold in his room, but at least he had a room. Right. You know, and yeah, those people were the only ones writing back then, and then now it isn't that much different. Right. And so you feel as though, or the fact of the matter is, you have too much to take care of in order to get the work done in the way that you would like to, or on the schedule you would like to. Right. Right. And so you would go away to McDowell. Or something along yeah. those lines. Yeah, I don't. I think for a while they hated me anyway because <laughs> I'm just good. It's my theory. They didn't tell me that. In fact, the staff comes up here to visit. They're my friends I really because know. I went so many times in the past. But I don't know if they liked Snowman, but that's too bad. <laughs> but the um, they got money from people funding, you know, which I think encouraged them to try to bring in people from all over the world sure. which makes the competition harder you know for a little new england girl <laughs> you know it's always hard mm. right yeah um so a couple of specific things about the book that i wanted to ask you um first in in my experience novelists usually fit into one of two big tents either minimalist or maximalist mm-hmm. um Less in terms of language and more just the volume of the size of the stories, right? Um, I just was started a book by um, Thomas Pynchon. He was a... Uh, well, my editor had him for a while. Maximalist. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm reading it. I'm going, um, 
I tried it twice and I couldn't quite get into it. But Which I'm one gonna, was it? It's um, V. Yeah. I, I should try it again, but because um, I, I don't never give up. There's been a couple, uh, you know, the um, hundred years of solitude. Yeah. I tried it once. I go, what? It sounds like tales or something. Then I got back in it. I love. It's one of my favorites. Oh, I really? always think about how what uh, that all meant to me. You know. So, so you got to keep trying. Is the tough part of those books for you just the scope of them? No. Like you. Well, maybe that's. It was the what, what made me think of it when you said language. He's more into language than characters. Right. I love characters. and oh, That's so evident in your work, especially the, this book. The Southern, see, my father's from North Carolina, and they say the Southern tradition was a lot of character. Yep. Eudora Welty and Faulkner and all those guys. But, you know, I, I know that's probably, probably, I don't know if that's where it came from, but I know my relatives are a lot of characters. <laughs> they are my southern ones. <laughs> well, and that's, you know, so maybe that's something we should touch on then because I there are obviously a lot of characters Yeah. in the book. Mm -hmm. um, for me, one of them who stood out probably more than anybody else, I mean, Gordon obviously is sort of... Gordon actually reminded me of, of um, Letourneau. Like there's a there's mm -hmm. a similar there's they're almost from the same lineage right like right. they they're both sort of like of this world and mythical all at once they're both responsible for lots and lots of people mm -hmm. um, and they're both uh, essentially very decent and I wondered I had a really smart writer tell me once that as novelists we all have our obsessive topics yes that yes, we keep coming absolutely. back to over and over again mm -hmm. to me. When I drew that line between Letourneau and Gordon, I realized that's probably that type of man mm -hmm. is somebody you come back to and keep trying to tell the story of in different ways. Right. Like you haven't gotten it right. Uh, you yeah, know? you keep doing Can it. Can you talk about that a little bit? What is it about that kind of character, this sort of mm -hmm. larger than life? They're, they're both really physically imposing, right? They're very tall. Big uh, Lucian was very little. At the end, you never see him right, you until see the him very, the very end, end. So you probably imagine big, right. and then at the very end, which he's on the last page where you see him, right. he's a little guy. Yeah. And so it was supposed to be startling that he's just this regular he's little, tiny. little guy in Maine, you know, <laughs> who's just a working class guy, and right. he's not. But he had that ability to. But that. Um, might have been all because of my fascination with the French. I have a very, always was fascinated with French, especially when we went to Old Orchard Beach. Sure. <laughs> you know, and they were, they were so cool. They'd be talking. And, and then I met my friend Jackie, and she, um, oh, she, she told me all this stuff. It was just pretty awesome. And Is Jackie the one who helped you with the, the Petois? Yeah. In the, yeah. Okay. She's now back in Auburn because she's from Lewiston. Yeah. But she did live in Gorham for a while, and we went to Pogo together. Nice. And, but the um, the I've never told anybody this before, about, because Michael says you better watch out when you tell people this. But the thing with Gordon and all these women was really my father and my mother. Really, my mother was like a hundred women, and my father was this guy who just wanted everybody happy. Huh. He wanted everybody happy. He wasn't real talkative. My I have a two brothers and one of them and me are very talkative but my father wasn't especially talkative but he just would always say I just he had southern accent right he go I want everybody happy just everybody happy and he he but my mother would be so he would actually say it yeah oh, it yeah. wasn't just how he behaved he would actually articulate that. yeah and my mother would um she had so many personalities she huh. could be all these things and she would, he was surrounded constantly by all these people, and it was just her. He was trying to please one person who housed a hundred. Oh, he wanted us all to be happy. He, he really was, um, you know, somebody who, he, he came from a huge family, you know, yeah. and he was the oldest and always loved kids and... You know, kids were attracted to him. And so there's that line between your father and Gordon then, in your mind? Actually, Gordon's probably more like me as far as the talking <laughs> <laughs> and the political stuff. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely. Because what happens is you start off, you're writing things, and it wasn't even an idea. It was like, oh, I guess I'll write a story. But no, I never do that. I just started these characters, and I'm trying moving them around 
and I realize it's coming out that way yeah. about my mother and father. But then they just take off on their own. And right, and that's, I mean, it's so obvious that your your stories begin and end with character, even though there's there's plenty to, to chew on sociologically and politically, I think. Um, mm-hmm. You know, another character in this book who really stands out to me, of course, is Bree. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, like, my, my mom was Bree, too. Oh, really? She had this very juvenile kind of way a lot of the time. Right. Although, but Brie has really grown up in certain ways. I mean, right. she, I, w- I would argue that she, what's interesting about this story to me is that you, you deal with, she's 15 years old and she has the sort of agency that we culturally, we don't allow 15 year olds to possess. Right, right, right. right. Um, I find that really interesting. It's almost like a third rail topic where like she has, a, she has a defined and overt sexuality to her, even though she's only 15. 15? You get it at 12. <laughs> you get but, it. But we don't talk about that, right? Oh, you know, it's so Victorian these days. I can't stand it. Yeah. People are so Victorian. Now, I grew up as a young adult in the 60s. They were not Victorian. <laughs> this is like a right. backlash. It seems to be. Yeah, the pen, it's a pendulum swing, the, the yeah. direction sort of thing. Yeah. Because it is. To me, it strikes me as one of those things that we all know and will acknowledge privately and have experienced in our own lives. Right, right. Like, like the age of reason seems to coincide with the age of sexual awakening, right? Like, and that's oh, yeah. 11, 12, 13 years old. Um, but it doesn't have a whole lot of cultural currency. And so it's it's surprising. It's almost bracing to see it represented so baldly in in a novel these days. yeah. Yeah, well, I knew I, when I got married when I was 16. I didn't, and my, my daughter My mother and I, did, too. We were, you, pardon? My mother did, too. She did, yeah, see, yeah. that generation was, my, my daughter and I were on the phone the other day, and she goes, oh, you were so young, and you married my father, <laughs> you know, or, meaning he's difficult and stuff, and I go, right. I, I, I was okay. I was nothing, it was not a major suffering. It was, and it wasn't. I mean, no more than anything in life is suffering. It was, and so somebody like Bree is just true to your own experience. That doesn't seem it doesn't seem odd to you to portray a fifteen year old girl <clears throat> as having that sort of agency, both in terms of I mean, she writes the recipe for a revolution. She right. undermines, I mean, she takes over the meeting at the 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 mansion with the monkey, the kids in the monkey outfits. Yeah, right, the, <laughs> right, right, um, right. Which I was telling my wife about as I read it. I couldn't keep it to myself. <laughs> um, it's such a great scene. Um, those but people, yeah, Cape Elizabeth had a lot of those kind of ladies and men. Oh, for sure. But I actually have friends out there now who are into the stockholder activism stuff. Right. And they're very sincere people. They're very. Um, and so, what do you think? Some th- ways like those people. What do you think about that then? So, you know, stockholder activism, co- corporations and rich individuals divesting themselves of. Yeah. Of, does it. Well, I have an anarchist bent, and I believe we all got to do it, you know, diversity of tactics. Sure. And everybody's got to do it their way, as long as everybody's doing it. You know, questioning how this is going and working to... So that's not something you would look at and say, well, that's not effective, or that's that's not meaningful. It's a piece of it, and everybody's got to do it in their own way. You expect, you know, like, those people, those, you know, people that are kind of... Um, richish and that way, right? To go out in the street wearing black masks <laughs> and, right, uh, and doing and, and um, let's see what else do anarchists do? You know, they throw the canisters back at the cops, and I can't picture them. They use you, hockey sticks now. Oh, hockey! St- oh, to get the canister back. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> and leaf blowers to blow the to leaf blow the gas blowers. Away. Awesome. See, technology works. <laughs> they picked that up from uh, Hong Kong, actually. Oh, Hong Kong with the umbrellas and stuff. Um, oh, poor Hong Kong, though. It's yeah. not working out. Um, there was something I wanted to ask you about. I was saying to Rachel earlier today that, I, that Maine has a really big literary community now it does yes i've heard about that <laughs> but but i think where you and i are a little bit different in a, a sortly rare a slightly rare breed is is native born mm-hmm. novelists particularly without any um formal training formal education in writing right so we're both the same in that way i didn't go beyond high school i dropped out of college after less than a semester and yet mm-hmm. you and i somehow found ourselves working in this medium where I think people look at us sort of cockeyed, like, how did you, how did you get here? 
You know, like, what do you... Yeah, because you didn't... Um, yeah, because they think... Because I did have a, a teacher that I um, liked a lot in college. I didn't finish either. I, yeah. I left after a while because I felt like I had everything I wanted out of it. And right. I feel real good about college. But I had this teacher, Ken Mosen, and he was just awesome. He's Russian. And, uh, you know, he's very um, expressive and creative and wild. And that really, really got me inspired in that way. Like, I, the energy that c come out of somebody like that in the way. And he also wasn't, to me, he wasn't like I pictured writers. Yeah. He was more um, a working class, in my mind. So it made it sort of, like, sort of what I was talking about with the Turner's Used Auto Parts, where I saw... I saw that name on the cover, I saw who you were, and then all of a sudden it became real to me that it was possible to be a writer. Yeah, right. But, but I, had wor I had worked with him in two or three, co uh, well, there was lit literature and then a couple of writing ones, poetry and the other one, the S fiction. Okay. But it wasn't like, I didn't like pick up a, formula from him or anything it was the energy right sure. so i was out to kenny bunkport at a thing a woman arranged for me and she and i both were she was a writer for yankee magazine and yep. we're answering different questions and a guy come up to me um kenny bunkport folks and they and they're older couple and he goes did you go to college did you ever take in writing courses in college and then the, the, and the wife's watched me, you know, they were probably not alive now. They were very oldish then, but um, I go, oh, yeah, USM. Uh, well, they didn't call it USM then. It was Pogo U. And, and he looks at his wife, he, and then they start walking away. He goes, see, I told you she couldn't have done it without training. Yeah. And then they walked away. And I thought, training? I never associated <laughs> the word training with Ken. It was more like, you know, like, sometimes just having somebody read your work back in the day. Sure. In college, anyway, would get you to look at it in a different way. It was really helpful to have to share it with, especially kindred spirits. Sure. And there were a few there that... Well, it's interesting, that anecdote, because I think one of the things that people don't realize is that until the past 60 years or so, writing was a very much egalitarian pursuit. It wasn't professionalized in the way that it is now. And so you, you, there was no such thing as an MFA program. The newspaper years writers ago. were the same. They right. were working class people. Right. And they, you know, they, they learned how to do it by doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you and I come to this in, the, in a very similar way. Mm -hmm. um, but part of the reason I bring up the fact that we're native-born Mainers is I was reading this thing, and knowing that I was coming to talk to you, I immediately thought of you. So there was a, uh, it was in the New Yorker, this article that I was reading. Oh, uh -huh. Um, and it was about the Senate race between Susan Collins and Sarah Gideon. Um, and it mentioned that Collins' campaign was going after Gideon for being, for being from away, um, using what the writer refers to as Maine's, quote, nativism as a cudgel against Sarah Gideon, because she's from Rhode Island, I think. Originally. Rhode Island. Oh, that's where White House is from. There you that go. That wonderful Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the first thing I thought was, you know, are we are we nativist? Because that word has a really negative connotation to it. Do you think that that by and large, as Mainers, were nativist? That, that you know, I mean. Tell me what it exactly is supposed to mean in, in when they use it like that. To, it? to me, what it, it basically means xenophobic and dis, oh, and dismissive. Of strangers. Just dismissive of people who aren't us, basically. I I, I know that. I I. This is an example, all right? We had neighbors up the road who were, we, we, didn't, we weren't real sure what they were. It seemed like they were Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. maybe from New York or something. And they had a big porch, and we'd go by, and we'd wave, and they were waving. And Michael helped them one time, and the car broke down. And then they were helping people when their cars got, guy got his keys locked in his car, and we did that. But they were, they still were a big family, and they, as they say, they do often keep themselves because, but they were friendly. Right. We loved them. I, I always said to Michael, some people have a problem with people from, say, Puerto Rico or something. I love those guys, and I wouldn't even mind, like, seeing more of them, but 
What more, what I don't like is when people move in and start telling you what to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? And right. it's a different value. And that but those guys have the same value as us. But some people they they come in and they start kind of bullying you around. Right. That bo- bothers me. And I don't want too many crowds cuz you know, of any kind of humans. So in that way I'm maybe a little worried about crowds, but that's down on the coast. <laughs> that's the, that's well, the that's crowd. the thing, right? All those, that writer community there sounds crowded to me. <laughs> it is. It is a little bit. And honestly, one of the things, one of the many things in the book that I responded to really strongly, almost instinctively, was the way that you write about the way the the inhabitants of, of um, the settlement, in particular, they have, like, bad reactions to being around the ocean. Oh, <laughs> You know, because I because I recognize that from my own childhood, like I lived an hour's drive away from the coast, but it might as well have been the dark side of the moon. And I think I think people who when they think of Maine, who aren't from here, they think of the coast exclusively. Right. Like this this part of the state doesn't exist to them. And yet there are so many of us for whom this is the only part of the state that does exist. And you do a great job of showing that in the book. Well, I grew up in Cape Elizabeth, but. We didn't live on the water. No. But I could leave this high school and take a walk down by the Girl Scout Club. And there was this big rock with ocean would come in. I would, it would have been Shore Road, I think. No, ocean. It was the one that went out to South Pole. It would, had two cottage farms that way. And mm-hmm. this big ocean come up to the rock. And I used to love to walk out there and stare at that. But... That was about my limit. I hated the beach. My brother was afraid of the foghorn. <laughs> well, he was little. I got sunburn. I got melanoma. I, you know, I, I'm not an ocean lover. Right. But that was pretty. But you know it. And see, that's one of the things about the book is that you grew up in Cape Elizabeth. You live here now. This seems like the part of the state that really speaks to you. Oh, uh, yeah. But yeah. you know and understand that other world. And so you're able to portray... Mm these really disparate environments with Mm. equal authority and and I think precision. One of the things that really jumped out at me was the way that you, your your characters and your stories are so physical. And in this book, um, the way that you depict um, the settlement in terms of it's loud, everything's always moving. Mm-hmm. People are skinning their knees and and you know building things and breaking things down and then but by contrast when we find ourselves in a a moneyed environment everything is whisper quiet yeah that not p- even the animals make noise <laughs> yeah the poodle he was, <laughs> he was right he was, and I love that it's it's it struck me as so true and that's what I mean when I think when I say it seems to me you understand both worlds um, yeah. It's it's mm-hmm. through that depiction, that sort of depiction, where it just feels authentic to me. I can never blame any humans for anything they do, because if you look back far enough, you know, like get on Pluto and you look down, <laughs> you see that we're just monkeys, and we are, you know. I refer to us as house apes. House apes, yes, well dressed apes, <laughs> right? That's what. Um, um, Hannah um, Holmes, her book was called The Well-Dressed Ape, yeah. and she talked about that. They, um, we, uh, just, ha- we don't make choices. We are, we're as reflexive as a bug. I mean, really, if we love red, it's because our eyes see red. I right. really love it, you know, and I'm, I just don't believe there's choices. It just hmm. seems silly to me. It seems like it's kind of left over from religion, where people were punished for... Um, bad choices, like not making God happy. It's kind of left over from that, that whole idea that, oh, they made wrong choices. And somebody who's got alcoholism, oh, they made a bad choice. Right. They, they, pro- they probably got a lot of anxiety that got them into it, and now they're hooked. I don't know, the whole thing just seems like not a choice. Well, and it also raises an interesting question. Were you raised Catholic? Were you Catholic? No, my great-grandmother, they were Irish. My, on my grandmother's side, main, my main grandmother, and she, um, her mother, they were Lynch and Fitzgerald. They live in York, Maine, down here. Uh-huh. Some of them had left Massachusetts, where, uh, and they worked in the factories. Yeah. Um, I'd like to think Lawrence, 
bread and roses, but I don't think I don't think that particular crowd was involved in that. But I like to think it. Um, but the, my great grandmother Annie, she says that the the priest came by and said they had to give money, and she goes, "We don't have any money." He yeah. goes, "You better have some money next time you come." She goes, "Like hell, I will." So that was that. <laughs> and she, they, the, so they start going to an, another one when they got to when she got to Maine, different. Thing. Part of the reason I ask is because the idea of, of being without choice, I was raised Catholic, and, and one of the things that I could never reconcile was the idea that God is omniscient. In other words, that everything that has happened is happening and will happen, he knows, and yet we have free will simultaneously. Yeah, right. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I know it. There's a the few things like that, no sense. So, right? the, so the, the idea that we're not we're not making choices is actually really interesting to me in that regard. Yeah. Um, yeah. So talking about the physicality um, of your characters and your stories too, I wanted to ask. Um, so you remind the readers over and over again of what your characters look like and how they move almost as though you're introducing the characters over and over again. Well, if I'm sitting here now, I see you guys throughout the whole visit. Yeah. I don't just see you when you show up and then you're just this empty space. <laughs> so it know. just makes sense, right? Yeah, I want them to feel like they're there and just keep seeing and keep noticing things about them. And yeah, because I, I guess maybe I'm not even thinking of the reader. I hate to be selfish, but, you know, kind of in my little world making up my, my characters. Of I kind of like to see them myself. It just it strikes me as sort of almost an old-fashioned... Um, and by old-fashioned, I mean in terms of, like, contemporary literature. I don't know how much contemporary fiction you read, but it does not dwell on the physical at all anymore. I notice a lot of it does not. Um, yeah. Which is weird. Because yeah, it's like, I know. <laughs> you know, as you say, like, here we are. Like, I keep looking at you. I keep noticing things about your right. physical being, right? There's a few that do. What, one would be Madison Bell. Madison yep. Smart Bell. Or he does. But who did I just read? Oh, I did just read the plane uh, on the plane of snakes. Have you read that? It's not a novel. It, it's um, no, Paul Theroux. It. Um, I love that one. But what did I just find? Oh, um, the the good Lord Bird. Yep. He kind of does it, and somebody loaned me two of his books. That one and the new one, and that one too. You kind of keep seeing them all. You know, and he's got a million characters. And a similar approach to he treats very serious things with a good dose of humor, right? He does, and he also seems like which you he's do a as nice well. guy. Like he kind of sees people nice, you know, even the the mob guy, and everybody's kind of nice. And I got thinking, somebody said one time, "Don't think authors are just like their characters. You might be disappointed <laughs> yeah. if you meet them and they brush you off." Yeah, don't meet your heroes. <laughs> <laughs> and and don't and don't you know the old chestnut about not conflating the art with the artist. Yeah, right. 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 <laughs> and I think that's true of me too. But um, so you really mean you mean to your dog maybe? No, <laughs> no, I'm actually nicest to him. Um, and hammering on the physicality thing one more time, I, I it makes me think again of Brie, her height and her hair and her asymmetrical face. Which I found really fascinating. Do you remember, was that a choice that her face was, her eyes were going to be asymmetrical? Or did it, she just present herself to you that way? She did, but um, I have a, up in the attic a newspaper article about a girl whose eyes were too far apart. Yeah. And the town, and they, the town, the people in town loved her so much. She was a, a friendly, nice kid, right? And they all loved her and they got together and raised the money to have her surgeons do something to her skull to move her eyes farther apart. They were, I mean, closer together. Her <laughs> eyes were far apart. How long ago was this? 80s. Oh, so it was a while ago. It's an old newspaper thing up there in the pile. Huh. Somewhere. So I thought of that. I mean, it wasn't even a thought more. It was more like it pops. It was just interesting to you, right? With ADHD, stuff pops into your head. <laughs> you know, this pops in, this pops out. This pops in. A lot right. of stuff. You want to write it down quick. I think that's also just true of us as novelists, too. You know, I, it reminds me of um, 
there was a priest who committed suicide in Waterville years and years ago, and he um, he jumped off the Kennebec, uh, the the bridge over the Kennebec. Oh. And, oh. But before he did, so I'm reading an article, before he did, he took off his hat and his shoes and his glasses and he lined them all up very neatly on the sidewalk. And that detail, see, you're responding to it physically. That yeah. detail, I was like, that's the story, right? Like there's, yeah. there's something in that about somebody who's ready to end their life, it's still important enough to him to take his things and arrange them very carefully. And what is... That's what is the mechanism in somebody's head, right? We wanted you to know if you didn't see him jump, you would know that he did. Maybe. that. Oh, that was him. That was Father Bob. You know what I mean? He, that's, he must have jumped over the... And this is what we do, right? Like, we take that one detail and we start right. telling a story. Right. Like, this oh, was right. his intention, <laughs> you know? So, so, to me, it's not just ADHD. It's just what we do as novelists. You know, we take... Right. Maybe these, maybe all novelists have a little... <laughs> it could be. It could so. be. <laughs> Um, something I really wanted to ask you about. Um, Don't let uh, if he watch your stuff. <laughs> if he starts to go pee on it, you know what? Yell at him. He can pee on whatever oh, well, he wants. As far yeah, as but he might electrocute us or anything. Oh, she's <laughs> or himself. <laughs> um, speaking of animals, so mm-hmm. I mentioned this earlier off camera, but I wanted to ask you. You touch on this, and you don't use this term, but you touch on it over and over in the book. So, like me, you seem deeply suspicious of the notion of human exceptionalism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. right yeah <laughs> that there's something innately special about people that makes us better than and thus more important than the other earthlings with whom we share the planet now you use that term in the book where um human earthlings, human right, earthlings. to distinguish them from the others we do cons- we are better to ourselves but ants think they're better and blue jays think they're better each one thinks they're better right it's just like Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> they think they're better, you know. But, but what about the differences that we have the power to act on our supposed superiority? Yeah, we're doing a great job, aren't we? <laughs> and that's what I wanted to ask you about because I feel like that's an important... It's of the many themes and the many moving parts in this book. That, to me, stands out as well. Like, what what's your take, broadly speaking, on the relationship between humans and other animals and is there a connection in your mind between that relationship and how we conduct ourselves as the supposed stewards of the planet? Because you, there's a lot of talk about climate as well mm. in this book. Mm. So, do you see it? What do you What do you feel like is the general human relationship with animals, and and how does that inform the way we be, we behave toward the planet? Well, you know, some of the stuff I've read about the human mind is like they say, we have to have some empathy, or we would eat our kids. Mm. So there's a certain amount, but some people have it more than others. I don't know if it's developed or they just have, or we just have to make sure there's plenty of us that have empathy, and some that don't. Because if everybody has empathy, then you wouldn't even protect yourself. Right. You have to have some in the crowd that are going to be the hard guys to protect the crowd. It just seems that way to me. Sure. So dogs, for instance, <laughs> are evolved with us for so many thousands of years that we do have uh, well they know how to manipulate us and all that and, but we we are manipulated by them through that empathy thing I ima- imagine that's it um, some like people will look at them as ugly bugs you know and probably if we didn't there might be some bugs that would f- poison us I mean I think it's all adaptive stuff I hate to put such a cold eye on, on this <laughs> no but. this is interesting because i because i i'm coming at it my point of view is i see animals uh, you know planet wide as sort of helpless in the face of our oh. our rampage and you are actually it sounds like you're giving them much more um what's the word agency like the dog is manipulating us yeah, oh, yeah. Is, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, that's interesting to me Same well about that. yeah but they, we still are making a mess of stuff um this there's two books that I really love. One, um, Gary sent, Gary and, um, well, Margaret's his sister-in-law, and Beth's wife, you know, at Gulf of Maine. Mm-hmm. They sent um, The Hidden Life of Trees. I love that book. But also there's one called uh, The World Without Us. Yeah, I know that one. I'm reading it over again. I think I read it a hundred times. He's talking about, I mean, boy... <laughs> I don't know. We are, we have made a mess, and but it was don't 
don't you think? I mean, it was like our job to do that. I mean, not that it was preordained, but that our we are curious little monkeys, you know, but we don't have any real power to, we don't have wisdom. Well, if you, you know, no. And we also, and ultimately, I think you're right, we don't have real power. Do you ever, you know, George Carlin, the comedian? Oh, I want him for president, but he's dead. He's dead. <laughs> but I, he'd but make a he good had president. a great bit about, um, well, two things he would say, you know, everybody's talking, this is in the 80s, so a long time ago, we're yeah. talking about like, we got to save the planet. And he's like, people, the planet's not going anywhere. We are. <laughs> Pack your shit, because it's time to go. <laughs> and then he had this other bit about how maybe what it is, talking about, like, we're curious little monkeys. Mm-hmm. He said maybe all it is is that the universe just wanted plastic and didn't know how to... <laughs> yes, that's what... I had a little thing like that, See? too. It was called Totally Consummate. It was plastic eating bugs. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, little things. Yeah. Right? It seems that way, because plastic's big. I thought, you so know... So maybe we're fulfilling our destiny by screwing everything <laughs> up, and then we can just... No, yeah. sorry, you were And then we say. can leave. It's like, you know... <laughs> you know, I was thinking about George Collin. I said, Michael, who should we be, be running against the current guys that are running for president? Mm. Like, if we were our own party. Like, we were the one... We were the... Um, what kind of party would we be? Uh, the folks party, right? And we want... We don't want those two guys... <laughs> George Collin, because he's got all this. Yeah, what's his name? Uh, Trump is very entertaining, mm. <laughs> and so George Collin is too. But oh, he's yeah. but he's cool. He's a nice guy. <laughs> so, but he's dead. But he is dead. Yeah. Do you find Trump entertaining? I think he's a bore. Uh, maybe. Well, all I listen to is Democracy Now. She has these clips. All right. Entertaining. Maybe, what's the word? Draws your eye. It's it distracting. Just, it's distracting. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. While they're doing all their stuff, trying to get rid of civil, you know. Exactly. The polluters are big. They're big. Because there is a movement against them that's real dangerous to them. It's all right if we fight over race and sure. sex and uh, whatever, abortions and guns. And things, that's fine. But as long as we don't talk about As long as them. we're fighting amongst ourselves. Right. Right. Say, I'll take that from you. I want to take that away from you. I'm taking that from you. You know, <laughs> you know. Uh, That's the monkeys, right? And now these guys are getting. They're watching us. They got these, you know, the think tanks, um, the Bradley Foundation. You know, different ones. They're they're watching us, and they go, "We got to be one step ahead, ten steps ahead of those right, guys." Right, because we're starting to turn our eyes toward them, and they know it. You know, they had that lady. <laughs> What's her name? That wants to be a judge. I mean, she is a judge. But she, uh, did they finally do something? That I think they, today was the floor vote. Was it today? Yeah. Uh, well, what was I going to say about her? Um, she, um, she, oh, it was a good thing. <laughs> but I was lost. I was lost. <laughs> well. Um, <laughs> it's gone. So one last question. Simple one. What's next? I don't know. I got to I got to go get the cat scan in my brain, <laughs> right? Let's see what's App going sauce. on there. I would I would like to um Yeah, once I get these health problems squared away, the covid thing is annoying cuz Michael has to be home more. Yeah. With the covid thing. And if I could get another book advance, it might help. But, mm. You know, I'm waiting December. Well, it would be February. The soft cover comes out. Yep. But I don't know even if they... Publishing might be having a hard time. With Amazon own everything now? I mean... <laughs> From what I understand, actually, books, independent bookstores are doing better than they have in a long time. Really? Yeah. Yeah, but the people come in social distance and wear masks and things. Yeah, and, and a lot of them are doing... A lot of their businesses online. Has moved yeah, online. Gary said that he would... Yeah, and he mails it out. Yeah. Yeah. I've always done that because I don't go up to Brunswick to pick up a book. Yeah. Of course, and then there's Portland with Stu's son. What? Stu's son. Yep, Ari. Ari, right, right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I used to do stuff with Bookland, a lot of stuff with Bookland, which was his dad's thing. Yep. I was just looking at a picture this morning of Joanne Reenan was the buyer for Bookland. Yeah. <clears throat> Look at this picture. It was the 80s. Oh, boy. It's gone. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's interesting. I think I think the independent bookstores are doing better, certainly better than they were ten years ago. I like to hear that. Yeah. That's great. So it, it's um, I think there's reason to be hopeful. 
but the publishers, I don't know what's with them. I know they work at home a lot now. Yeah, <coughs> like everybody. Mm. Well, I'm told that we're out of time. Oh. <laughs> I heard I heard the voice. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me here. This is oh, great. It was uh, easy, but <laughs> so the audience... <laughs>